talk's going to follow on quite nicely uh, from the last slide of Richard's. Uh, his, one of the final comments was, we need a better understanding of um, small behaviour, especially with regards to downstream passage. So hopefully what we're going to talk about now is going to cover a few of those bits. Um, uh, today we're going to talk about a project that's been going on for the last couple of years um, up in North Wales. Uh, looking at behaviour of smolts around uh, a large set of sluice gates and a couple of low head weirs. And all of the organisations just at the bottom of the slide there uh, have all been involved at, in the project at various points. So, off to North Wales. Um, for those of you that, that know the area, uh, we're working on Bala Lake, um, otherwise known as Thin Tegid. Um, it's a large lake. Uh, and there is an additional reservoir, Thin Kellin, just here, that flows down. Uh, and what you've got is a quite a unique situation where the outflow of, of Kellin Reservoir uh, feeds into the Avon Chwerin, River Chwerin, and it joins the outflow of Bala Lake uh, upstream of a large set of sluice gates. Now, on certain flows, the sluice gates can be shut down, which restricts the flow out of the area, and you can actually get the water coming down the Chwerin, backing up into, into Bala Lake, into Thin Tegid, which is quite an unusual situation and is referred, can be referred to as, as flow reversal through the rest of this, uh, this talk. So the reason this, uh, this study came about was the, basically due to the failure of the upper D tribs uh, under WFD. Um, um, one of the potential reasons for this was given as the... Uh, uh, the the presence of these sluice gates within the system and how they were operated. The flow reversal was deemed to be potentially quite a, a, quite a negative impact. Uh, a desktop study done by THA looked at a very, very poor survival. If fish did get caught up in a flow reversal, ended up in the lake, uh, a very, very poor survival for then downstream migration. And the other side was to look at the, uh, the impacts of movement uh, of juveniles, uh, of smolts, delays, there's been quite a lot talked about with delays today uh, about how this can narrow this window of opportunity, so obviously if we're getting significant delays, this is right at the top end of the catchment, uh, we've got about 100 kilometres down to sea, which some of the sites are uh, not very far, but uh, about 100 kilometres down to sea, so if we are impacting on, on the delay, we're going to um, uh, really close down that window of opportunity. And also look at the mortality of smolts around the sluice gates uh, and where, they, where they're dying, where the losses are and what could be attributed to that. So, so far it's a, it, we've, it's a three year project. We've done two years and I'm going to be talking about the tagging that's been carried out in 2015 and 2016. So, these are the sluice gates, just to give you an idea of, of what we've got, what we're dealing with. Um, this is photo looking downstream. The sluice gates were built in about the 1950s, the same time as Kellen Reservoir, approximately. Uh, we've got six gates um, numbered there. So one, two, three, and four are undershot uh, sluice gates, referred to as the main gates. Five and six, five is the upstream and six is the downstream. You can't see it in the photo there. And uh, they were designed uh, when it was first built as a, as a fish lock. They've never actually been operated in that way. Uh, majority of the time, five is operated out of the water completely and the level is controlled with, with six. Um, the, they were built uh, to, to regulate flows and regulate levels within the D, uh, both for uh, flood risk, um, to allow uh, abstraction downstream, a lot of the abstraction is downstream on the D, uh, and also to, to regulate levels both within uh, Tegid, Thin Tegid, for a summer amenity level and also within, um, within the downstream, uh, in the main river downstream of them. Because what we get uh, on, on the Chwerin, there's the National White Water Centre uh, where there's an awful lot of kayaking and rafting. And they have releases from Kellin, which are block releases during the daytime hours. And we don't want to waste that water, so the sluices shut down, close down, restrict the amount of water leaving and that water then gets backed up into uh, Thintegid, into Bala Lake. So this just gives a bit more detail the, the, uh, of, the, of the site that we're working uh, on. Uh, you can just see the outflow of Bala Lake there. 
and this is the, the Chuerin coming down here. I'll just run through the site just because it's quite, quite important later on to understand where the various sections are in terms of the results. So, so as the water's, you know, the, the Chuerin is flowing from top down here. And all of these uh, sites are where we had acoustic arrays. Um, so the array one is there. We had a fish capture site, which is just there, that red star. We've got array two just downstream of the capture site. And then we have a low head weir, which is referred to as weir X. The flow then carries on down, and under normal flow conditions, comes down this channel here uh, and passes over another uh, weir, low head weir, weir X, that has a Lirinia fish pass on, and passed array three there. And this is the confluence. And then we have uh, an array four at the entrance to the lake and a, an array five just immediately upstream of the sluice gates here. Array five in 2016 was uh, expanded and uh, to, to create a, a VPS array uh, consisting of 12 receivers uh, and sync tags associated with them to give us real fine scale um, movements of smolts and how they behaved within that area um, to try and assess which gates they were using, were they milling around, were they moving backwards and forwards, were they uh, making repeated attempts to try and pass the gates. Going downstream we've then got another gauging weir with an array immediately upstream. About a kilometre downstream we've got a, a seventh array and then there's a, an eighth array about 50 kilometres downstream um, in the river. Talked quite a bit, a few people have mentioned tagging and stuff. Uh, so I'll fly through these couple of slides, but all the kit was a Vemco kit. We used the, um, the, the, the V5 tags, um, 180 kilohertz, just to size the tags. We wanted to have a, a, as low impact on the, on the fish as possible. Um, that's one of the receivers, the VR2W180 uh, receivers. Uh, and you can just see one of the sync tags there, V9 sync tags. And that's all attached to a concrete block. That, was, that would have been one of the blocks that was put in the river in the, in the VPS array, just to... Um, uh, and they, in the concrete block, so they didn't move position. And, and we got good results in that. They, they very, there was very, very little movement, which is, is key to, uh, to, to ensuring the VPS works. Um, this is the, the setup where we, we actually went and caught the fish. Um, it was very simple. Uh, we just used a couple of um, modified fike nets and put some very, very soft uh, keep nets on the lower end. Um, there's, there's three arches of this bridge, but we just found that all, most of the fish came through these two arches under different flows. It was a very simple way of catching, catching fish, and we think we had pretty high efficiency. We always set up at dusk, fished until sort of 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, one thing, when we were catching all the fish, we, we'd bring all of the fish to the bank and we'd tag the appropriate fish, ones that we wanted to tag, and then we would release all of the fish together um, in groups to try and avoid, uh, in, you know, minimise impact with predation. So as I said, we used the, uh, the V5 tags. Um, those of you who saw the... The, the Lost at Sea film last night will have seen a bit of video footage of, uh, of the procedure. So a small incision made uh, and the tag, tag inserted through, single suture and then covered with the uh, wound sealer. Uh, the fish here, it's quite a bit of talk about sort of size of smolts today. Um, we were averaging a, a, about 130 millimetres, something like that, with a minimum of 120 mil uh, fish, which resulted in a... a um, a tag burden of about 3%, which was kind of the limit of where we really wanted to be with this. Okay, so just moving on to the uh, on to results. So I'm going to be comparing, comparing two years, so 2015. So to start with just, just very basic um, how many fish we tagged. Uh, as you can see, we've got wild and hatchery origin fish there. Uh, we have, just below uh, Kellin Reservoir, we have a, a semi-natural rearing pond, um, a release pond, that we, we stock, uh, we used to stock uh, salmon into, salmon smolts into. Um, we, we've carried on using uh, some hatchery origin fish because the, the results of both years have shown that there's not been any statistical difference um, uh, between them, um, particularly. So we're happy to use a mixture of ha hatchery and wild. Uh, we tagged 
94 fish in the first year, so 55 in the, in the second year. We, we decided to drop the number of fish we were going to try and tag in the second year because in the first year we tagged uh, over 50% of the fish uh, that we tagged in one night, which is suboptimal in terms of uh, what we're trying to achieve out of it. So we decided to drop the number of tags, try and expand the number of nights that we were tagging. One of the key things uh, that, that we've uh, mentioned it here is, um, is flow reversal. And these two graphs, top is 2015, bottom is 2016. The, the red lines, the red block lines, are showing uh, releases uh, from Kellen Reservoir. So there, apart from this one here, which was a mitigation for a pollution incident, they are all releases uh, for recreation, for whitewater recreation. Um, and they're all daytime releases, um, and the black lines uh, on both are the, are the flows at Weir X, uh, which was the, the, the first of the low head weirs. As you can see, 2015 uh, was a lot wetter year, which is going to be quite key to some of the results uh, compared to 2016. Um, and uh, it's, it, that's turned out to be quite an important part of what we've found out from this, from this project. So these are just some of the basic results of, of what, we've, what we've had from this. Um, as you can see, one of the biggest differences is the number of fish lost before the sluices. So in 2015, we only lost 2.3% of the fish that we tagged before they reached the sluice gates. Uh, in 2016, um, we lost 20% of the fish before they even even got to the sluice gates. Now, as I said, they've got to pass from the tagging site, they've got to pass over two low head weirs, um, and they, th there was, the, the flows were far lower in 2016. Uh, so there's, there seems to be quite a link there um, that, you know, if, they're, if, they're being, um, if the low flows are causing them to be delayed, are there increased levels of predation um, or, or, or more? Um, desire to, to stay in the area that they're in. They don't want to cross these weirs, at, you know, sharp crest. Are they, is this shallower water? Is it just causing them just to not want to, to move over them? Both years, we've had uh, a number of fish head towards uh, the Array 4, which was the one on the entrance to uh, Bala Lake, Clint Eggard. Um, and similar numbers in both years uh, experienced uh, fairly significant delays. Um, and again, going back to this window of opportunity, if, uh, you know, if we've got a, 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 a delay of around over four days, then potentially quite an impact from that. The flow reversal data, um, as you can see, again, 2016, uh, there were far, fl far fewer flow reversal events. Sides from one block, uh, all of these events were in the daytime, so we wouldn't be expecting smolts to be migrating. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, it's still of a concern. Uh, you know, certainly later on in the migration window, maybe smolts will be trying to push down during the day. Um, during the flow reversals, uh, in 2015, two fish actually left the Chewerin uh, during a flow reversal event. And of those two fish, both made it through the sluices, both passed it through the sluices. In 2016, uh, we only had one fish that left during a flow reversal event. Uh, and that fish, that fish failed to, to make it past the sluice gates. In 2016, there were three other fish uh, also went the wrong way, if you like, and went up to Bala Lake. So they came out of the Chewering, not on a flow reversal, normal flow. So the flow would have been going left, and they decided, for whatever reason, to turn right. Uh, and they all went up to the lake. None of them made it to... Well, two of them didn't make it past the sluices, and one of them did make it past the sluices, but didn't make it down to the, uh, the array 50 kilometres downstream. So uh, one of the things we've been quite interested in has been the, uh, the transit speeds of, of fish through, through the, uh, the sections. Um, the control reach uh, is, was between... Uh, array 2 and Array 3, so, so control reach and control reach 1, they're the same, same reach. They're between Array 2 and Array 3, so that is a section that has two low head weirs in it. 
The Control Reach 2 that THA brought in this year, uh, that was between Array 3 and Array 5, so the array below the uh, uh, low head weirs and the VPS array. In 2015, there was a, um, no, no real difference between the, the speed of passage between the control reach and, and the passage through the sluice reach. So both of them have got, uh, had structures in them uh, and there wasn't really any difference. As I say, it was a wetter year, higher flows, so that may have helped fish certainly with the with passage over in, in the control reach passage over the uh, over the low head weirs. In 2016, however, there was a, you know, quite a significant difference here, statistically uh, significant difference between sorry, between the sluice reach and the and the control reach. Um, you know, it, it just that you know the two sites with structures in really appear to have slowed fish down quite significantly compared to a, a reach that had no, no barriers within it. Um, just want to mention in 2016, uh, during the flow reversal, the, the fish that were present within the section, within the control reach two, um, had a, a mean speed of 0 0.01 metres a second. It's, there was too, too few fish to, for any kind of statistical analysis, but it kind of shows that it was during a flow reversal, um, it really seemed to slow fish down or make fish stop altogether. Uh, next, we've got some of the VPS data um, that I mentioned. So I've got four, four tracks that, um, that I'm going to show you. Uh, this is the first one. On all four of these tracks, gates one to four were, were closed. Um, so the, uh, the, the main undershot gates, they were all closed. The only route for fish to go through the sluice gates was, was through gates five and six, through the center of the, of the structure there. This, this route was fairly typical uh, of, of what we saw. Um, the numbers are given as uh, decimal minutes on, on, this, on this track. This fish um, didn't. Sorry, this fish did make it down to array eight. So this made, this one made it to the to the lowest array uh, that we had on on the uh, study. This fish starts to show a little bit of, sort of milling behaviour upstream of the sluice gates. You know, sort of fairly characteristic of kind of avoidance behaviour, making multiple approaches. Of all the fish that did make it to the uh, did make it to the sluices, 23% of them made some kind of uh, multiple approach to, towards the structures, to pass through the structures. Remember, 100% of them in this year did pass through, but 23% uh, of them made multiple approaches to try and work out where to go. Again, the numbers in that are given as uh, decimal minutes. Some of them start getting a little bit more complicated. So these are it's in decimal hours, and you can see multiple approaches up and down um, before eventually it did pass through um, and it, uh, it, did, it didn't make it down to the, the, the lowest of the um, uh, arrays or A8. And then final one is that which um, so it was it, that fish arrived at the, uh, at the VPS array uh, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on the 7th of May and left at uh, 20 to 10 on the 9th of May. So was really quite significantly delayed at the structure. It did, did, it did eventually pass. It made it to Array 7, um, but it was a kilometre downstream, but it didn't then get down to, down to Array 8. Um, so it should be noted that these, all the numbers on, on that one are in, uh, in decimal hours rather than, than, than minutes. So just in terms of... Uh, you know, the future and what we're going to be doing with this project. Um, we're going to be tagging again this year, 2017. We're really running the VPS work because uh, you can see it's some quite interesting information. Um, potential that we may use uh, some pit technology to, to work out whether smolts are passing, exactly which gates they're passing through, although there's limited use to that, we're thinking. Uh, the VPS is sort of indicated uh, prefer route for uh, that smolts appear to, to want to use. So the ones that seem to go straight through tend to tend to go uh, hug the left bank before going straight through. So there's there's potential for um, 
uh, modifying the operating regime that we've got at the sluices to try and encourage fish uh, across to the, uh, to, to the fish pass. At the minute, all four gates, so the, the control gates, are you moved in unison, uh, so they all have the same gap, and it may be better to open up one, uh, the sum of the four, to allow that amount, the right amount of water through, but uh, be able to change where, where we want fish to go. Uh, obviously, key thing, you know, with smolts, we want to, to, to maximise this uh, upper water column migration route uh, and maximise the aperture sizes. So if, uh, if we have got to have gates in the water for um, regulation, then maximising that size to make sure it's, you know, it's as big as possible and uh, therefore reducing the damage and, and what have you. Another thing is going to be to assess uh, the wider migration routes. So we've got a number of, uh, of further weirs downstream on the D. Um, so looking at, at what kind of impacts we're getting further downstream, uh, any kind of cumulative impacts. One thing that's, that, that struck me has been the we, we lost quite a lot of fish before they even reached the first array. Um, so they were tagged and they didn't even reach the first array. Now, the low flows, uh, the weir X, which is just uh, controls the level in that reach, had been modified about four or five years ago. And that reach is now is very, very barren. Uh, it's very shallow. Um, and I'm concerned that, I have concerns that, that not having good structure, not having good depth, is, is resulting in a high level of predation of, of any fish that are moving down there. So, you know, having work to carry on and, and make these, these areas um, as suitable for fish as possible. And that's it. That's just a, a photo of, you can just see one of the gates there. That's gate three. And a big, I think it was about 18 pound salmon coming through the gate. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks for listening.